when I was in college, I was with people 24 seven, but I wasn't Mm -hmm. as drained as I am now. Social interactions, they were so easy. You didn't have to think about it. I think it was like pretty widely known that she was like a pretty, like a proud racist. I didn't have sex in high school either, but I assumed that everybody else was. And I was trying to figure out like the angle that I would be at if I was making love to this mirror. Right. And if anyone touches my head during sex ever, I'm like, we're not doing this anymore. Welcome back, baby. This is Not For Everyone, a podcast hosted by one hater and one lover, my girl Jess. I um, have a question for you. Immediately. Yeah, I have an answer. <laughs> I don't, but I love to hear. I love to hear it. Do you? How do you ever wonder like what you look like while having sex? All the time. I was yeah. thinking about it as you were asking the question. It was like Just in now. the back of my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot like, and I'm not even talking about like my body. I've I've developed a certain like recently the question has plagued me about like what does it look like to be beneath me looking up at me? Oh God. That's a question sex. I actively avoid. Because you know why I think about it? Because like at a certain age, when you take like when you uh, take a selfie or something on your phone or you're FaceTiming, like you can't hold, you cannot afford to hold the phone that Mm -hmm. low down. Mm -hmm. And yet that is the position I'm being seen at in many coital activities, like looking up from above. Sure. And um I've done a couple, I've I've experimented a couple different times trying to figure out what the experience of me is like this so week, how do you I... go about doing that you set up a contraption <laughs> a where contraption. you can or you take pictures I have, I have a mirror okay I have like a I have like a, a vanity sized mirror maybe like a foot wide two feet tall that I can set up to do my makeup and I took the mirror to bed with me Ooh. the other day and I just laid it down And I was trying to figure out like the angle that I would be at if I was making love to this mirror. Right. And, um, and was just trying to get the angle. I don't think I really liked what I saw, but there was a, there was a moment while I was trying to seduce this mirror on my bed that I saw me like kind of from above in this moment. Okay. This is like the secret single behavior you know like they talk about on sex of the city which is me on my bed with a mirror mimicking yes. mimicking love making and trying to see what it what it looks like i guess there's two views right there's the view of like somebody who's beneath you which is a right. view that i have thought about but i also yeah don't really want to think about because of what you're saying like it's not the most flattering angle I was gonna say I yeah and then there's a view of you externally like a third party watching yeah who's in the corner right my little stuffed avocado Timothy is in the corner getting to see the show and (laughs) is that what you call Ryan my my stuffed (laughs) avocado (laughs) Timothy (laughs) yeah he's watching he's watching me in the stuffed animal um (laughs) and I feel like sometimes I do have thoughts of like from the outside, I bet I look great, you know, but yeah. from underneath. From underneath, I don't know because there's not a lot of other times where I like that angle of my face. Like if I'm vlogging or taking a selfie or FaceTiming and I'm holding the phone too low, it is not a nice, it's not nice to me. Right. And then while having sex, I'm feeling hot, I'm feeling sexy. But then sometimes I remember like, this is the, the low Ooh. selfie phone angle. It can't be that good. I tr- I that's the the kiss of death is thinking of it while you're actually having sex because I'll think of it afterwards yeah. but during sex I try to remove my my brain is like not in the picture when yeah. I'm having sex because I think that's I good. have to I, yeah I don't correct. know if it's always been that way but like now at this age having had enough sex and being in like a relationship where age. I feel comfortable like I just am like I'm not thinking because yeah. if I was thinking, those are the types of things I would be thinking about. And I would totally not be able to finish, perform, yeah, enjoy myself. <laughs> it wouldn't be good for me or the other person. I, I all I also feel I've noticed this in podcasts a lot. I like am very hesitant to say like orgasm or coming. Like I can't 
Oh, cum I don't feel feels weird. So dirty. Cam, cam, yeah, it's dirty as hell. I can feel us both like tiptoeing around the words, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know why there's like I feel very bold in person, but it feels, it feels so, <laughs> so scary to say. On a it podcast. is weird. It's, it's funny. I, well, I'm actually so curious if we could dig into that because I've noticed before, like a couple weeks ago, you were like. I realize that sometimes I'm alluding to sex, but it's not clear that I'm alluding to sex. Yeah. And so I need to like be more direct about it. I think you're a little bit more coy about it than me, but I still have my discomfort, which is weird because in every other sense, I feel like our personalities are flipped in that way. Like you're a little bit more bold and you're foul mouthed Samantha, you know, and I'm right. I'm Jess. So <laughs> and, I'm um, Jess. <laughs> and I'm Jess. And I'm Jess. Just Jess. Um, so anyway, I I have I have thought that that's very interesting. And another piece of that puzzle is like when I've done stand up, a lot of my material has been not about sex, but like there's innuendo laced into a lot of the jokes. I'll be talking about something else, but then do like a sexual innuendo joke um throughout my set or whatever and for me it's very it's actually very freeing to be in like a public forum talking about these things so I guess I'm curious like what your take or hang up or experience is you know there that being said there's still words that like come and there's certain words that are like dirty talk words a little bit that I still feel weird saying but I'll talk about it is come your word or do you use a different word come is just top of mind because just a minute ago when we were talking I decided to say actively in my head chose the word finish instead of finish yeah I know I know finish the job um I yeah it's a good question it's funny I I do think about it a lot because I think on stage I used to do stand-up sets pretty about uh I would talk explicitly about sex but that feels similar to like the medium of YouTube where it's a little more a performance. It's a little more a character. Like Mm. there is a difference between doing the podcast and YouTube and they're, they're both of them are me or like stand up as well. Like they're all versions of me, but I kind of think of it as like different friends bring different dynamics out of you. Like the podcast brings a different dynamic. YouTube brings a different dynamic. And YouTube is definitely a little bit more of a performance of me, which feels, I actually keep it so PG on YouTube, mm-hmm. but there's a little distance. And um, same with stand up, it gets maybe more R rated, but there's still some distance. And it's like, I'm delivering a performance to you. Whereas on the podcast, it feels very, the whole point is just to show up as a person. Um And when I was younger, I was, when I was younger, like 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, maybe I was really kind of sexually explicit. And I like wanted to seem grown up. Um, I, in a way, like often hung with like kind of older people, or I could like get away with coming off as older Um, and part of that at that age in my mind was like talking about sex in this explicit way, Mm -hmm. which actually was like super immature. And, and I was like talking a big game. I wasn't doing anything. I was so afraid. I was so afraid to do anything. I was like very afraid of sex, but I was talking this big game. I don't know what the deal was. Yeah. I just, I guess it it seemed cooler. And Mm -hmm. then afterwards years later I definitely had like a big shift where I'm very private about that I don't like to imply anything sexual or reference anything sexual unless it's with a person I'm being intimate with um and and then there's the podcast so the podcast is new and the podcast is this place where like I want to represent sex and sexuality in like a healthy way not in a puritanical like condemning sinful whatever yeah I want to represent it well like for younger women and also I've made this huge switch personally probably over the last 10 years to be way more 
private and protected like that's a a, a private thing that you can get access like one person can get access to with me so i don't know that's yeah. why i kind of like struggle with it i think because i've taken it to an extreme when i was way way younger yeah that's that's so interesting i feel like first of all and you kind of like mentioned this but there's something really interesting about the fact that for you to like you've you've said many times the podcast feels more like where you just show up as fully yourself and there's no hiding and you can be a little bit more free on YouTube. You keep it a little more PG. Um, it feels a little bit more exposed for some reason. So that is one half of it. But then the other mm -hmm. half of it is that because you're more free and seen as more fully yourself here, it's like anything you say is really representative of yourself. Like it's, you don't get to blame it on, oh, that's my character or my persona a little bit. That's a yeah. version of myself that I turn up the notch on for this performance on YouTube on the podcast it's like this is just me so yeah. then if you decide to talk about certain things on one hand you want to fully represent yourself on the other hand you're like that's so it's exposed in a totally different way yeah um, it's exposed without the level of control we're not you know we edit the podcast sometimes we edit little bits out but for the most part we're not nitpicking everything we say we want it to be a free-flowing and like honest conversation mm -hmm. um so I get it, yeah it's like an interesting nuance that dichotomy um when you were younger that piece also was really interesting to me because I feel like we were like we were friends at that time I knew you at that time yeah. our friend group and you definitely as part of that was very like we loved to make sex jokes we knew nothing of what we were talking about what but I feel like what else do in high school yeah it's like you're talking the most talking the biggest game exactly um I learned like so many things about sex just from our friends jokes you know which like is the worst place to learn things about sex because everyone there is pretending oh totally. I feel like that's where it's like what you talked about with the 69 where it's like people who are hyping the 69 are like people who haven't had a 69 yet Correct. or like maybe haven't had sex yet and then yeah. you're like oh that must be the thing that's important yeah yeah I was really um like, if you're saying I, that I'm the person who taught you about sex in high school, that is not good. <laughs> that is not good news. Because I, I you were probably one of them. You were probably one of them. I didn't have yeah. sex in high school either, no. but I assumed that everybody else was. And I don't even think I thought about it that much in high school. Um, I guess I didn't think about it that much, but sometimes it would come up. Like I'll yeah. never forget when this girl who we were friends with, um, came to school on like we were in like ninth or 10th grade and she reported to us at lunch that she had just given her boyfriend a blowjob and okay. I mean I still think of it to, mm -hmm. to this day as like time this stood still yeah. yeah this pivotal <laughs> moment in my development where it was the first time that somebody in my friend group had had like shared that they'd done something yeah. sexual with a boy yeah, she, she's on a different level now she's entered right. a different realm and I feel like when she said that, other people were like acting like they knew what about it too. That's like so funny. Maybe they'd also done it, or if they hadn't done it, they were keeping that close to the chest and trying to act like they know they know about this topic. Yeah. And I was just silent. I was like, <laughs> was just, <laughs> Take, you know, in shock, taking stunned. notes, just eyes right. wide, the, those big brown eyes in the corner, just like a hundred percent. And like trying to be <laughs> chill about it, but also be like, one day I'll need to know this, like write this down for college. Probably won't happen in the next four years, but maybe after that. And um, I don't know. I just like, I felt very inexperienced and very naive and was very much picking up cues about sex about mm -hmm. how we talk about sex etc from other people but it's it's funny to look back and be like nobody knew what they were talking about I wasn't I, I felt know. like the the odd one out I guess is my point I don't oh, know if funny. you did you weren't um I don't remember I don't really remember feeling like the odd one out I don't remember that many of my feelings about it I remember that I was like terrified of sex I and especially for some reason, terrified of like blowjobs. I, yeah. um, I had this boyfriend in high school 
and maybe it was junior junior year maybe senior year or maybe it was junior I don't know but it was it was some point where I was like okay I'm expected to do the low job deed at this point like I was mm-hmm. aware it was kind of expected and um but I was like so afraid and this was my brilliant plan to kind of get points but also not have to do it which was at some point he was over at my home and we were hanging out in the basement. And my plan was while we're in the basement, I was going to like pretend like I was going for it and like, okay. you know, get, like undo the belt or like whatever. I don't know. Like I got like a few steps down the line and just wait. And like my family was home upstairs and I just like waited until there was like a single audible noise of someone moving a chair upstairs and then kind of went through this show of like, oh, well, I mm. maybe we should, I guess maybe we shouldn't at the moment, like, oh, there are people around. But like, I was definitely willing to, like, obviously you believe that I was willing to, but we just won't right now because like there's people around. Right, and, like, right. Stopped for doing fucking anything at all. And um, that was my big, that was my big brilliant plan. Did it work? Did you actually do that? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Yeah, and, and did you didn't ever do, didn't do anything? I lost my virginity the day the after future... I graduated. Okay, with him or somebody else? No, somebody else. Okay, um, who so you never gave and... that guy a blowjob? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't remember that. I think I just like the. It was just like a carrot dangling in front of him. It was for <laughs> him. It was a carrot. For me, it was a bomb. And <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, I lost my virginity the day after graduation, or maybe the day of graduation in the back of this guy's car after which he laughed and said haha you still graduated a virgin what the fuck it was pretty terrible he was a pretty mean guy that is tough was, was mean. what ew yeah, okay i, I, I hate that <laughs> yeah me too. Um, i hated it i hated it too but i also lost my virginity in a weird way which is i don't know weird is the wrong word i don't know what the word is for it I didn't lose my virginity till I was, it was like my 21st birthday and on the day, I, day of, day of, the I think it was technically like maybe five days later, but okay. it was the day that I went out with friends to celebrate my birthday. And Kai and I have this whole crazy story of this night where we got drunk in Baltimore. It was my birthday's in the summer. So we happened to be like on campus and able to like celebrate in Baltimore but anyway that's not relevant um <laughs> of course correcting I always do this I, always do this. I love it so much <laughs> you're just like you just think of like one more interesting thing to say and you're I know just, like, getting farther and farther away from the story I know I love um, that you've added the course correction now I'm never gonna stop you I'm never gonna I, course correct. I, I'm just like where's she gonna go where's she gonna end up with this this is a story that like maybe one day Kai will come on and, and help me tell or something because it yeah. really is a wild night um, okay. 21st birthday celebration story. But it ended in running into this guy who I had a bunch of classes with at school and we didn't know each other. We'd never spoken before, but we were both drunk and I just you were, went up you to were him. Out, you were out of school at this point or you're still in school? Um, This was like summer before senior year of college. Okay. And- yeah ran into him was like oh you're in a bunch of my classes and next thing you know according to Kai I don't really remember this I was like sitting on his lap apparently and the next thing you know after that we like disappeared into the night and I went home with him and hooked up with him so like similarly I don't know it wasn't like some big uh you know I've been waiting so long to have sex with this boyfriend and now it's finally the time like those romanticized virginity oh. stories from oh my TV. god I think I think that's like one percent of the losing your virginity stories Probably. I think those are those are absolutely the exceptions I think most of them are like humiliating or horrifying or just awkward and like kind of nothing right for me it was like I just want to get this over with which is kind of a weird attitude to have about it but I was 21 Mm. I felt like I was so late to the game and that wasn't I don't know that didn't really bother me that much but at the same time it started to become something that like when I interacted with guys or was into somebody or whatever it was like an insecurity that I had like I've still not had sex yet 
And yeah. so I think like ripping the band-aid in a situation where it wasn't somebody that I was like interested in dating. It wasn't somebody I had any sort of history with. I was just able to like do it and be like, okay, I'm not a virgin anymore. For some reason at that period in my yeah. life, like that was what I needed. So I don't regret oh, yeah. it, it, but it was weird. It was awkward. It was like not, I don't know, not anything to write home about, but I guess that's what it always is. Well, it was, was it particularly like upsetting or anything or afterwards you were still no. like, I'm kind of glad I checked that off the list. I feel fine about it. Yeah. It wasn't upsetting yeah. either, but um. I don't know how we got to this point in the conversation talking about sex and why we're so sex. awkward, but we also want to talk about I know. it. <laughs> well, because the thing is when you, when you think about like most middle schoolers, teenagers, kids of whatever age are mostly learning about sex from their peers, which is really not learning about it at all. Cause most of them don't know what they're talking about haven't had it at all it's all just like a bunch of like urban legends about blumpkins and cream pies or whatever like the worst versions of capturing sex and um and and like no one else is really talking to them about it in a human way mm -hmm. and so for that reason I actually do it I I want I actually want to like provide that for younger people yeah. um but it's it's hard that the way to provide that is to also I want to provide Reveal that to yourself. other people but then I also I don't like talking about myself that way with peers and stuff or with friends or or well I will with girlfriends but not like at the podcast when I try to think of what I'm comfortable saying I think of it as like I'm at like a family I'm at like a dinner party with like family friends and stuff and somebody's mom is there and like some friends are there and then like some random people there and like maybe one person in my family is there what would I be comfortable saying there I will say crazy stuff I will say crazy stuff at a family friend dinner party um and there's like a certain degree yeah that I will go but I don't think I would start talking about my sex life I don't know but I obviously am and you know um cats that look like Tony Soprano but I'm torn. Yeah. I'm torn about like whatever my responsibility is. Cause I actually do think it's really important for kids to have like, can you imagine if any of like the young men we were with had any exposure to like the experience of sex as like, like holding like consideration for another person in sex <laughs> or like an interpersonal relationship or like care or just like really any way of thinking about this other person that's not represented basically at all because people are just uncomfortable everyone's uncomfortable talking about it to like a child so yeah. you just well, don't yeah. talk about it at all and then all they hear is like porn or something from the internet or something from their friends yeah the two sides of what are what like younger people are exposed to are that like the porn jokes, like really graphic side of sex or mm -hmm. like abstinence and uh, wait till you're married and like extreme, like let's just not talk about sex and let's make it taboo and let's make it something that you shouldn't be doing. There Which isn't... is proven real. It's proven really effective. If you tell kids <laughs> not to have sex, then they just don't do it. It's really effective. Right. Yeah. I have heard that works. Yeah, totally. Right, um, right. No, I, I totally hear you. There was this like seminar on the first day of college, like during orientation, they brought some group in and it, the, the theme or the group or organization or whatever was called I heart female orgasm. And I actually didn't go to it because I was like, I don't have sex. I don't need to go to that. But yeah. <laughs> I went to that. And she still to this day will tell me, will reference it and be like, I didn't know that sex was like for my pleasure, that masturbating was normal, like yeah. all these different things until I went to that thing. I'm so glad I went to it. It like changed mm. my perspective. And it was, it was for men and women alike, like hopefully trying to teach people still at a young age that, yeah, there's another person to consider and like, it's okay to have sex. It's okay to do it for pleasure. Actually, like make it about the woman's pleasure, guys, stuff like that. So um, I agree. Mm. I I feel a responsibility and an interest to talk about it and normalize certain things. And 
I don't know, just make everybody feel more comfortable talking about it. I think it's that's the reason why when I've done stand up related to sex, like that's the motivation. I love Nikki mm-hmm. Glazer and I always talk about her and she's like a very, <clears throat> very well known for doing that in her stand up. And it makes me feel um, seen and free to like consume that type of comedy and content. So I like, you know, I want to contribute to the same thing, but it is hard to know the line. I think I feel comfortable talking about it actually less like, how do I say this? I I feel comfortable talking about it in generalities. I don't feel comfortable talking about it specific to like me and a partner, you know, like I'm never going to talk about my sex with my boyfriend directly, but I'll talk about what I like in sex or sexual experiences that I've had. Yeah. Yeah. Or... It's nice to protect it as like a, it's like a special, like private thing that you don't want. Like, it's nice that other people aren't fucking involved. Right. Yeah. So I don't know for me, I think that's the line, but yeah. And also not saying the word come. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing um, that stands out to me for like, this is a generalization, but I think it's pretty accurate for most young girls. And maybe the way it's present, represented to young guys too, um, the way sex is talked about is mostly just about like satisfying the guy. If we're talking about heterosexual sex, which is the kind I'm familiar with. Yeah. Um, yeah, the idea, like you said, with like the seminar that Kai went to or whatever, I, I think I would have benefited from that as well. Just the idea that like there was something to be enjoyed as opposed to like this performance or, you know, even when you see articles about like, you know, people beyond teenagehood are consuming this stuff about like, you know, moves to please him and this and that. It's just so much focus on this performance for someone else. And um, there's so much like anxiety around that and pressure around that. And that's the way you're going to keep somebody or that's the way you're going to interest somebody. And yeah, I feel like the, I don't know, like your personal experience of sex, like as a girl, I think, I think a lot of women do a lot of things. They really have like no, um, personal interest doing because it's in the name of, keeping someone or intriguing somebody or yeah I think that's where like a a lot of pain comes from but that's something that makes me kind of sad totally um yeah I feel like the first time I gave a blowjob I didn't really want to didn't really know what I was doing right didn't really feel comfortable doing that with this person um but I just felt like it was an expectation Totally. And that's what, that's what I shared with mine too. Yeah, I'm sure right. I should. I feel like I should. And it's the classic like pushing your head down, which I fucking hate. And if anyone touches my head during sex ever, I'm like, we're not doing this anymore. It's like a trigger mm. thing for me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like after that, I realized like, okay, I went further than I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um. I can look back on that and like feel okay. You know, it's not like, it's not overly traumatic, but it's like a point in time. It's a milestone in my sexual journey of like, okay, that happened and I don't want that to happen again. And I started to be really um, like kind of overcorrect and be like, I don't give blowjobs unless it's like a boyfriend now. <laughs> blowjobs are for boyfriends became my my yeah. new slogan. Cause I was I like, like that that's tagline. a really intimate Thing. like it feels more intimate to me it than does vaginal than sex. sex your dick yeah. is in my mouth like yeah I'm doing that it's... with just anyone the bases we're taught yeah. like the bases and I think they're so out of order yeah um, that's so I agree because there's also something like inherently there's like a it's like a different power dynamic naturally in the setup like you are not receiving any like intrinsic satisfaction right. from that so it's it does I think I agree it feels much more vulnerable yeah but it's taught as like the precursor yeah to sex and it is and it is interesting like the bases are are these precursors to sex and they're also like way more they're about individual satisfaction as opposed to both people 
receiving. I I mean, I don't know, like totally. I, I heard I didn't hear anything about like, female satisfaction ever. Right. For so I, long. I I'm trying to figure out how how I want to say this because like oral sex. I feel like I didn't even know oral sex existed for women until like too late. Like I thought oral mm. sex equals blowjobs. I didn't realize that yeah. getting eaten out was a thing, or at least it's something I learned after having already heard about blowjobs. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You always hear mm-hmm. about that first. You always hear about right. a hand job. Blowjobs blow got you a lot of PR. Hear about fingering. Right. They get a lot of PR. Right. They have a good PR team. Yeah, um, active PR team. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. It's it is so backwards. It is so backwards and I feel like every woman has a story multiple stories oh of God. just like doing things that they felt were expected. They felt oh, probably other girls are doing that and so for me to like be relevant to this guy, I have to do it too. Like so many weird so upsetting pressures that go into it. I don't know. Yeah. We'll keep like talking about it. I know, I know. There's a lot to it. Do you remember on a more PG note? Do you remember your first kiss? Yeah, I do. Um, not well. What, what What was his name? What was his name? His name was Adrian. He okay. was an upperclassman. It was in college. I was 18 for my first oh, kiss too. So again, girl. late bloomer. Um, I didn't like know him super well. I was at a party, but he was really attractive. I still remember what he looked like. And I don't know. We were just chatting at a college party and started making out. Yeah. And I I feel good about it. I don't know. Nice. That's where it that ended. And then my friends were like, okay, we're leaving now. And I was like, cool, got got what I came for. I'm no longer a kiss virgin. Gotcha, baby. Like- <laughs> kiss virgin. Oh, like never been kissed. Yeah. That's yeah. So sweet. I don't know. Not an amazing story, but I feel I feel <laughs> confident in this dude. Um, okay. how about yours? Um, my first kiss was I think it was in seventh grade um his name was bud i remember yeah. is that a miss simpsons yeah. person was yeah. he at miss simpsons yeah, yeah, yeah. we yeah. need to talk about miss simpsons but okay yes i know yeah, who yeah, you're yeah. talking about okay his name was bud that was his full government name and <laughs> um and i didn't like him um one of our friends liked him and he he kissed me though at i remember that a middle school dance. I remember the song that was playing. It was like, um, I think it was Sandstorm. Sandstorm was really big then. Oh, perfect. You remember Sandstorm? Yeah. <laughs> of course I do. And that's all I think about is like Bud Connolly, or we'll, we'll bleep his name, Bud, kissing me at a seventh grade dance. And then I like walked myself out of the gym that this dance was held in and just started crying. And I was like, <laughs> like crying to one of my friends. I was like, does it count as your first kiss if you don't like them? Oh, I was really, really upset about it. I just like, I don't know. Um, And uh, it kind of caused a drama too. I think one of my other friends had a crush on him and it was a whole love triangle. Then I got my first kiss taken from me. And right. I don't know. I wish him all the best. He, yeah yeah <laughs> he doesn't need to be wrapped up in this um 20 years later still no. still upset about it it um, was funny I saw him at some point in college I had a boyfriend at his school and I went to visit the boyfriend there and I saw Bud like how many years later is that eight years later like so I guess five, not that much more later but yeah. it felt like a lifetime later um yeah it was just a funny funny experience to run into him again um like he was smoking a lot of pot well all of this tracks with what I remember of that guy <laughs> yeah. which is like not very much but I do remember I think like a lot of people either had a crush on him or were friends with him or like I remember that there was a little bit of drama surrounding this person yeah. but I have two. So, so first of all, do you remember the first song you ever ground to? Have we talked about this? <laughs> we I, have, we talked have talked about, about this. No, the first song I ever ground to. No, I don't remember. I remember mine was, because I, I was pure I was and not. that was a big deal to me. What was the first song you ever ground to? Switch by Will Smith. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We did. We actually talked we about We did mention on that one time. Yeah. Don't um, have an ass switch. Yep, exactly. Okay, the <laughs> second question related to d- middle school dances and Bud and all that. Not mm. more, not a question, more so a topic that I have wanted us to talk about because it is oh. fucking weird. Yeah, yeah, I know what this is. There was this thing 
that I guess was like leftover from debutante days. Like it was, it was a debutante type of program in our town. It was a cotillion. Cotillion. That's the word. Okay. I think it's called a cotillion, right? Yeah, no, that seems right. It was called Miss Simpsons. Everybody did it. It was like the thing that you did come middle school. You signed mm-hmm. up for Miss Simpsons. You would go every Friday night to was this it like every ballroom, Friday. Was it every Friday? Like Maybe oh every other, god. but it was frequent. Oh my god! This ballroom, and it would be like girls and guys in the same grade from schools in the area, and in you would learn wear. like manners. Yeah, you had to dress up. You would wear- learn like there was a dinner and a dance, and you would learn like you know plating at the dinner and like sitting down and being polite and like having a nice dinner with people and then you would like dance and you'd have to ballroom dance and they'd teach you some of those things we learned a foxtrot and a waltz and i remember there was a receiving line you had to go through this line remember the receiving line of adults like whatever parents wanted to come and like torture their children at miss simpsons would come and join this receiving line and all the kids had to go through and like shake each of their hands and say nice to meet you or so i don't know some weird performative manner thing yes which was common in uh-huh. our upbringing too um but it was also it was also a a, a, a place of tremendous middle school horniness because there were so yeah. many unisex schools where we grew up there are a lot of boys schools and girls schools and this was the place in middle school this was the place we met boys that was it yeah yeah that's a key point um so I didn't sign up for it when everybody else did because I didn't really know about it my parents didn't know about it yeah (laughs) yeah like I don't know it's a very white American type of thing and I think my parents just like wasn't on their radar yeah like why would we do this why would we send our child back 20 20 (laughs) fucking years 40 years but I got a little bit like I felt a little bit left out that everybody else would go to that on Fridays and I wasn't part of it so I finally signed up like maybe everybody had been doing it for a year and then I signed up the next year and the first panic attack Caroline Winkler that I've (laughs) ever had in my life was at Miss Simpsons in the seventh grade. Can I guess what what was happening? Sure. It wasn't really anything specific that I remember, but yes, paint the okay. paint the scene. So what I remember is that first we'd get to Miss Simpsons, we'd go through a receiving line where you had to like fucking I fuck all the all the parents who decided <laughs> to show up there. And um I think and I think Miss Simpsons herself is this slander if I say she was known to be pretty racist I think it was like pretty widely known that she was like a pretty like a proud racist I think she'd feel good about that yeah I I think think she would that's true I don't think she would ever sue us for the slander because she'd be like please (laughs) put that in my obituary it was it was she's this she was like this like older maybe 50 60 year old woman definitely like an old southern something it it was all weird like white people vibes Mm -hmm. for sure Mm -hmm. and um you go through this receiving line everybody'd be like oh you're white you're white i'm white you're white and <laughs> when i come through they're like we're not sure what she is yeah, like yes <laughs> and then we would go and take a ta- sit at a table i think the girls sat on one side of tables boys sat on one side and they would pat oh and then at some point the boys were asked to stand up and walk all all the way across oh, this right. empty ballroom. The ball the boys stood up and walked across all the way across this like expansive ballroom and would ask a girl to dance. And that's where I would imagine the panic attack happening. Sitting there, yes, a little twelve year old girl waiting for one of these guys in their like oversized suits to come ask you to dance a fucking waltz. Um, and that's exactly where it happened. Yeah, is that where it happened? Exactly the, the moment. I remember <laughs> I remember walking in and feeling uncomfortable with like the shaking of the hands and all that stuff, but whatever. So weird. We sat down for dinner and I was like, oh, dinner's just with my friends. Like it's just girls at the table and I'm here with Caroline and Colleen and whoever. Like, great. So dinner was fine. I was like, we're just, this is just like lunch at school today. I'm with my gals. <laughs> and, then, and then there's the part where The boys come and ask people to dance and everybody had already kind of known each other a little bit 
before right. and I was so- late to join this. So some people had like guys that they kind of always danced with or at least were friends with. And so they would kind of get together with them and start dancing. And I didn't have that baseline. And I also just like didn't ever hang out with boys and just it was so unfamiliar, so uncomfortable. Yeah. Felt very left out and very like lost. So I went to the bathroom and I was feeling like, you know, anxious oh, tummy ache. Yeah. And I went to the bathroom and I like threw up in the bathroom oh. because I was just that that's like a thing that happens with my anxiety sometimes. Or when I was younger, yeah. it happened a lot more with my anxiety baby, baby um, and had to like call my parents to get me. And I never went back. Miss Simpsons no. was not for me. You never went back. Oh, you just went the one time. Yep. I was like, fuck that wow. place. Wow. Yeah. You made the right call. It was a really weird thing we did. Baby Jess. Yeah. Because the experience of sitting there waiting for the boys, first of all, they're approaching you. It's like the horsemen of the apocalypse, like <laughs> sta- rising together and like crossing yeah. the ballroom and one by one. You watched your friends get picked. It was like picking people for kickball. One yes. by one, they would get picked and you'd just be left sitting in the chair, like unchosen. It was the worst feeling until like the dregs of the seventh grade boys came over like the leftovers and would sheepishly, you mm-hmm. know, ask if they could sweat on you mm-hmm. um, while you tried to do the waltz. It was, it was so strange. It was so weird. I never understood why people enjoyed it because there was a feeling yeah. to me that, my friends like looked forward to this every week and stuff, which is the reason that I wanted to sign up. We had no other exposure to meeting boys. Yeah. Or at least I didn't. I like did not have guy interactions until I started doing theater at like other schools in high school. Um, Yeah. So I think from my perspective, it's, it was so weird, but that's where, that was where the boys were. They kept them in that ballroom. Yeah. I think I was like, oh, I thought this was like fun with the girls. I didn't I didn't realize the point is the boys. I'm not interested. I was just so not interested in boys for oh a really long time, I think. Or okay. I would be interested enough to like I feel like I had certain people who were my AIM like <laughs> relationships, like boys that some I don't know how I met them. Maybe my friends connected me literally on AIM. And I would just chat with them. And I feel yeah. like that was enough. I was like, okay, totally. I'm getting, which is that was to this day kind of true. Time. It's like, yeah, that- <laughs> I'm getting text attention. That's pretty good. That's when I was single and like on dating apps, a lot of what I wanted was just like somebody to send me messages. So I felt hot, but not actually to follow through on it. It was um, a safe place. AM was a safe place. Yeah. 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 It's a safe place and also full of predators. One time I oh, accidentally- yeah. One time I accidentally typed in, did I already tell the story? I think so. But tell it again. People might be new. Well, I don't know. I thought I typed in my friend Colleen's AIM screen name (laughs) and was talking to her for like 45 minutes. And then eventually Colleen started asking these really weird questions being like, what are you doing right now? And like, how old are you? And I was like, Colleen, you're so crazy. You know how old I am. <laughs> and and then at some point it occurred to me that like, maybe I wasn't talking to Colleen. And um, I was like, wait, who is this? And I had typed in Colleen's screen name wrong. You just type it in, you can start talking to that person. And I was right. just talking to some middle-aged dude for like an hour before I realized it was not Colleen. I was 13. And I think um, about this all the time because I'm like, what were you yeah. talking about that you this think you're talking thing. to Colleen, like talking the, about school yes. or boys from Miss Simpsons or something? It, and then it was only made possible by the fact that Colleen was such a mm-hmm. lovable weirdo freak that she she could talk about she could say anything and you'd be like, oh, Colleen, like, for <laughs> so you know, it, yeah. it, it was it was really the Colleen that made it all possible. Yeah. Yeah. If it was me, it wouldn't have. You would have known immediately. This is not. Yeah. This is not uh, Gator Jaka. My my mm-hmm. aim screening. Um, something. Can I tell you something sweet as heck? Please. So I was talking to Prince Abby, our editor producer, this week, who's a dear friend of mine, and we were talking about like our relationship to loneliness, loneliness, um, the role that plays in our life now, and loneliness if you haven't heard is rampant 
think more people are lonely than they are feeling connected and mm -hmm. plugged into a community, um, which was funny. This came up in conversation in a week where I thought all my friends, including Abby, were like done with me. I thought they were all <laughs> done with me. I thought she was too busy and bopping around. And then we ended up talking and she kind of brought up how she was feeling really isolated. And I was like, mm. I've been feeling really isolated. Like, why, why, what are we been doing? We could have been hanging out together. Yeah. But she kind of brought up um, what I thought was a really lovely thought about how kind of the way the way we hung out as kids, the way we hung out in high school with friends and the way we hung out in college, which was more <clears throat> just occupying space together. It was a, a much more integrated way of like you, your friend would come over into your dorm while you're doing homework or you're doing laundry. Yeah. Or it wasn't this like pause everything I'm doing and have this hermetically sealed friend date where we go out and eat a meal together, where we go out and get drinks together. I like doing those things, but I also get really sick of just like staring at people over a plate of food or mm -hmm. having to pause everything I'm doing in order to go and have this like corded off time to engage in a social, excuse me, a social interaction. Um, and Abby lives, you know, relatively close to my neighborhood. And she was like, what if we just like, I could just stop by your apartment. And if you're working, I can just sit on your couch and we don't have to talk and we're just like in the same space Aww. together or we go and run errands together. And it was so it, it, something that I loved it because it was like it sounded something that's such a light lift. Um, We did it the other day. She hit me up and we just went and like went grocery shopping together. And then I went the fuck home. It was really short, but it was mm. a little thing in the middle of the day. I, you know, we both were working, went grocery shopping and then went home again to go work again. Um, and it was like 45 minutes we spent together and it just felt like a really lovely way to ha be like, have life and socializing integrated in a way that I feel like it's not right now. I feel like work is very separate. Socializing is very separate or relationship is very separate. And, um, I thought it was a really good point from her just to like, try to find ways to have like a more casual overlap where it doesn't feel like you have to, it just feels easier to integrate people. I don't know. Does that make sense? Totally does. I, I love it. I love it. Um, I feel like it can be hard because for me, I'm like, Oh, I want to make this happen Im immediately in my life. How do I start doing this tomorrow? It's, nice. it's a great but idea. I also feel like I don't live close enough to some of my friends or like I work from home, but some of my friends go into the office, but I'm still going to find ways to do it. Cause I love this. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about it. Um, I went to my coworking space yesterday and I was walking down the hall and I was like, something about this. All of a sudden I felt like I was transported to school in like high school or college, mm. just walking down the hall of my coworking space. And I was like, that's what works about this. Like it's a bunch yeah. of people in sharing space. You don't even have to like, talk to them. I don't know any of them. I don't know anyone else that joined. I mean, I've like kind of befriended, you know, the front desk person. And like, I, I say hi to some people, but I don't know any of them. I didn't sign up for this place with any of my friends, but just the feeling of like holding space with a bunch of people doing work next to somebody else who's also doing work. And mm -hmm. we're not talking, but I don't and maybe feel you never alone. Talk. Yeah. Right. It's a big it's deal. It's like it helps my mental health so much and makes me feel more productive and like more able to focus. Um so then imagine, yeah, I love the idea of doing that with a friend just like, oh yeah, you're walking, you feel like getting out of the house today, come sit in my apartment and we can co-work or the yeah. grocery store thing is great. I mean like just little moments. It doesn't have to be so built up because it come is over, yeah. quite you come exhausting. Over and work while I'm doing laundry or something. I think something that right. stresses me out a lot is feeling like I have to drop everything in the middle of the day to go do like a three hour hangout or like it has to be this big thing. Cause I'm so, sometimes when you get in that mode where you're so deprived of people, you're like, well, if I'm going to do people, it's got to be a three hour a chunk plan. of time where blah, blah, blah. And um, it's like a lot of pressure in a way. And it's not, it's not how we hung out um, when you're living with people or you're sharing a space. 
I think it probably gets harder as you're living alone and I love living alone, but, um, yeah, that's the other thought I had when you mentioned like a dorm room. Um, yeah, because totally like when I was in college, I was with people 24 seven, but I wasn't Mm -hmm. as drained as I am now. Obviously I was younger and had less things to worry about, but at the same time, I think some of it is that social interactions, they were so easy. You didn't have to think about it. It was just like, when I go to my dorm, there's going to be people oh, yeah. there. When oh, yeah. You didn't have go to go to the library. There's going to be people there. Yeah. In the common room, there's going to be people there. And it was just like built into everything. Tot- yeah. And I felt less drained. Like I was so much more of an extrovert then than I am now because it was like right there for me. I didn't have to like put in the work to fulfill the social need yeah. um and I That's even like- had that thought recently because I was like at dinner with some friends and kind of I think you know it's nobody's fault everybody's tired and going through this exact same thing that you're describing but it felt like do we have stuff to talk about right now like it just felt kind of like forced yeah. and hard to have this you know dinner. why because the thing I got so tired of with like that when my social time at a certain point over the last year or two, all of my social action, social interactions were just like staring at people over a plate of food or over a drink. Do you run out of things to talk about because there's no other place your life is overlapping. You're not sharing a common environment. You're not going and like having experiences together. You're just like looking at each other. Mm -hmm. Um, And in a way, I feel like it's something that guys the average guy's generalization maybe does better because they, they, they're so much more focused on doing things and the average girl is so much more focused on like talking about stuff, but there's really not that much to talk about. Like just the catch up, what's been going on in your life and what's new with you. That's pretty draining. If that is a hundred percent of your social interactions, I found that incredibly draining, incredibly unrewarding. If that is the nature of a hundred percent of my social life, um, like, recently Justin and I have been going together we went to like a couple different just like literary (laughs) readings oh yeah um I went to one with Abby Prince Abby and um I don't know I'm not like I'm I'm nearly illiterate but it was Mm -hmm. really lovely to go and just like do something experience something together have something to comment on um that is so it just gives you I don't know, a sh- the shared environment, the shared experience to reference um, yeah. is, is a big deal. And if you're, yeah, when it's always like this, like scheduled, we're going to have a dinner at this time and that's how we're going to be friends. It gets so depleting. Well, I was even having this thought of like, these are some of my best friends who I've known for a really long time. How are we like, is this the point? Is 10 years, 15 years, the point when like we run out of things to say, but I kind of thought about it and was like, well, so much of our friendship, the first half of our friendship was doing what you're describing was like sitting next to each other in the library, not really talking about stuff, just like holding space together or going to acapella practice. That's like a shared experience that we had stuff that we were working on together. And then we had that to talk about outside of practices. I don't know. I was just kind of like, oh, there's just like our lives are less integrated yeah, and we and I don't think- hold space with each other, even just silent space. And so it puts a lot more pressure on the let's all get dinner this weekend. And sometimes there isn't that much to say because it hasn't nothing's really changed in your life since two weeks ago mm-hmm. when you last saw each other. I don't know. It, it was it wasn't making me start to question my friendships because I like I know that these people are so important to me and that it doesn't change but it was making me a little bit like is something wrong with me I I don't have anything to contribute here and this is helping me realize why it can make you question yourself or question the dynamic but I really think it's like I got so sick of just like looking at people over food don't fucking make me eat another meal with you Uh, we have to go fucking do something yeah um I don't know I think it's really hard I think it continues I think it just I I think it just uh gets exacerbated as you get older and people move away or they start families or get married or whatever everyone just gets like more um entrenched in their own lives as they should but it's like harder and harder to 
have like common ground with the people who used to be your friends. And then, you know, you start becoming friends with the people you do have common ground with, like the other parents in your kid's class. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you naturally like, it's, it's significant to be able to just like reference the teacher you both hate or, you know, the classroom drama you're both in on, or just like have a common reference point instead of constantly just doing a catch up. Yeah. I don't know. So I I like the idea of trying to find um, low lift right ways to be more integrated in a daily way. I don't know. I'm working on it. It was nice though. That's really nice. It makes me, it opens up a can of worms that lives in me a little bit. She's worming. She's worming today. Um, (laughs) I definitely have a fear of getting older and losing connection and like losing closeness with my friends. I think it's, it's natural. It happens um, for all the reasons that you've listed, Mm -hmm. but something that specifically I think about as I like make decisions for my future is the fact that I likely don't want to have kids. And a lot of people in my life do want to have kids. Mm -hmm. And what will that look like? You know, today it's easy to say that because most of my friends don't have kids right now. Um, But once they do, if I don't, my life will look very different than theirs. And, you know, that's a lot of the reason that I, that I think I don't want kids because I do want my life to look different in that way. I do want like a little bit more independence and just like, I don't, I don't really want the life that they would have, mm-hmm. but what it would mean but you is that- you want to have the friendships. Yeah. What it would mean is that we have less in common. We have less yeah. stuff to do together. Um, I mean, I think the biggest, I, I, and in addition to having- a little bit less in common. Obviously you can still relate to a human on a bunch of different levels. Um, but it's just like having kids is so logistically and schedule demanding that to a certain degree, it's only possible to socialize with other people around kid related things. Yeah. So much of your life, that's why it happens. It's, it's for like logistical reasons. Totally. Yeah. It's just something that I'm like, becoming more and more aware of yeah. um as I get older some of my friends are starting to like talk about having kids soon and um I'm pretty committed to like I'm still gonna show up for these friends and they're the type of people that have shown up for me but when you know exactly what you're saying it's like it, it's not even up to them it wouldn't even be up to us that that natural progression could mm-hmm. happen because it's just logistically like a very different life so I don't know. I wanted to acknowledge that we got a DM mm-hmm. about it. Um, mm. Somebody asked a couple weeks ago, like, do you have suggestions for how to make friends in your 30s and 40s when you don't have kids? Um, really tough. I don't have those suggestions, but I will, you know, let me know if you do. Let me like, I'll, it's something I'm thinking about. It's something that will become more and more relevant potentially for me. Um, yeah. and I, I just, I guess I just wanted to acknowledge that that's another hard aspect of it when, and it's not only with kids, it's like anything that makes your life look a lot different than different. somebody else's. Yeah. Some people travel for work. Some people live in a suburb versus a city, like all these lifestyle differences that just yeah change how we connect. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, in my feels a little bit about that, but yeah. I'll figure it out. <laughs> I know. Um, I feel like I'm in this kind of in-between stage right now where I have really good friends and I feel really good about my social world. And I feel like it could all disappear very quickly because Mm -hmm. everyone I know will probably like move away when they start having kids. Mm -hmm. or when they officially get married or whatever um and I feel like it could all disappear and probably will disappear really quickly um and I don't I I I don't know I um I've spent a lot of my life like kind of lonely and isolated 
I think for a lot of people that loneliness and isolation only hits after college. But for me, it started a little bit earlier. I hit it really hard before I went to college when I was au pairing. Mm. Um, it was like extreme, extreme, <laughs> severe isolation. And so I started dealing with it a little bit earlier. And then living in New York, it was like a crash course on the reality of people moving away all the time. So mm -hmm. I, I do feel for some reason that I've been like a, like familiar with the concept of people leaving your life all the time. And it just happens. It's going to continue to happen. I don't think you really get to stop it. Um, even with people with good intentions, even people who want to stay in touch with you, they're going to get married. They're going to have kids. They're going to have to move away. They're going to get a different job. It just happens. I don't think you get to like cling to people and like try to drag them to stay into your life. So I think it's something that um, it's really difficult to <clears throat> kind of problem solve. And we're all going to have to do it. And we're going to have to do it a ton, multiple times throughout life. Um, and one will be when people start having kids and stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't really know exactly what the solution is but I think to just name that if you're going through a period of like feeling isolated because your life stage isn't matching up with your friends um it's pretty normal and it, it'll probably happen a bunch of different times and it's pretty uncomfortable um and you yeah. might be surprised that they're feeling the same way like from the other side of the coin you know they might have a different setup than you it might not yeah. be for the same reasons but they might be feeling the same like I love that you and Abby had that realization of I like know, you've been feeling so this way funny. too yeah yeah I really was like oh she's gotta be busy or something right but she weren't we all assume everybody's hanging out without us that's Mindy oh, Kaling's book title everybody's um, hanging out without me you want to like I it have an update that oh. I think is really relevant okay for not for everyone okay so we've talked a little bit about Caillou the the bald baby tv show that cartoon cartoon sex that icon. caroline loved <laughs> caroline yeah. loved and some people wrote us in and were like fuck I, you oh, i genuinely did i uh there's definitely like a, a phase i went through that liked bold men okay like a full a full bald i actually like it too i've never i don't think i've been with a bald man I don't think I have either. But I find them attractive sometimes. Like I'll yeah. pass by one and say, oh, all right. Yeah. Pass me um, a Diesel or such. A Bruce Willis. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Caillou. Yeah. This is about a different ball. That's a child. Zone. That's a child. Yeah. That's a child. Yeah. It's about to get very unchildlike very quick. Okay. There's a rapper, Puerto Rican rapper named Bad Bunny. And he just came out with a new album and I really like him. I don't know any words that he's saying. He raps in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, but it's like fucking hot music. Okay. And he has a lyric in his new album, actually in a song that's about Kendall Jenner because they are like oh, dating. low key dating. I've seen it. Um, He describes his dick and compares it to Caillou. Oh no. <laughs> right. Oh no. Oh no. It's really but you oh, don't know. No. Because what do you mean? Spanish. Does he say Caillou? Oh he says oh, Caillou. Oh. So he he's rapping Caillou. in Spanish and then you just hear the word Caillou and then he oh, keeps rapping in Spanish. Well, is he calling it is he is he referring to Caillou the character or is he referring to he's refer it's the a French proper noun in French it's a proper noun. Okay, he's not saying just a pebble. No, it's a proper noun reference oh, to no. Caillou. Does, does he know that Caillou is a child? Has anyone? Told I, him yeah, I think he. Child? I think he definitely knows oh, what he's no. doing. He says he's basically saying in the lyric, like I went on a deep dive translating all of his songs because I was like, I need to know what these mean, and they're all dirty and uh, amazing, honestly. But this one lyric is about like prepping for sex earlier in the day. Like he knows he's gonna see her, so he's getting ready, and he like trims up the area and it's bald like caillou is like basically what the lyric is and i was like oh there's <laughs> so many other things that you could be bald like other than right. a child other than Let's a give young some, child give the man some suggestions bald like a cute for his number. rewrite bald <laughs> bald like a pebble bald like a kneecap <laughs> i think i think all of these are equally sexy as a child's cartoon 
Bald like a cucumber? That would be fine. A kneecap cartoon? No. Oh, you're saying it's like just, I see what you're saying. I think that those are equally as unsexy as saying Caillou. Yeah, I think cucumber is a step up, I would say. Right, totally. There's something there. (laughs) That is weird. People say weird things in rap sometimes. Yeah, It's so funny. There's some like hilarious, anyway, I don't know. What? I don't like that. There's some hilarious. Oh, I thought you were going to reference something. There's just some hilarious rap lyrics where they're saying something and they're like, oh, but it rhymes or it's a good pun. It's so funny to me how like rappers, rappers, cool boy rappers are really big Mm -hmm. on puns, which is like the lowest dad humor available. Why? I don't know why puns get like are like so cool and rap. It's still not cool to me. That's like the coolest thing you can do in rapping is like have a cool pun it's uh, it's so strange wow that is so astute because the dorkiest fucking thing ever yeah but i love i have actually said and i'll call it when it's in rap i refer to it literally most of rapping is just puns but i'm like i love wordplay in a rap i love puns in a rap but as soon as you're not rapping i hate it i just feel i'm Um, i've been called out i'm okay i just googled drake Pun, oh, he has puns, puns, but instead it came up with Drake plums, which is a different kind of Google mm. search. Okay, wait, let me let me get let me read you some fucking. <laughs> okay, hold hold on, let me see. Um, lo- loaded loaded like a semi semi naked pictures. She oh. knows my dick. Call that n word, Richard. So dick, as in a nickname I'm for Richard. Richard semi semi naked pictures and this is like the holy grail of rapping um <laughs> don't shit on a whole genre right now i'm not prepared no, to defend i'm not saying favorites. i'm not saying rapping is bad i'm not saying Lil wayne is bad i just think it's so weird how puns are yeah. objectively the lowest form of humor i wouldn't call them humor at all they're dad jokes and then yeah. in rapping it's like the epitome of cool it's cool because they're rapping it anything yeah. well that's i mean that's like the same same as the caillou thing it's like if you listen to this lyric and remember it's in Spanish too, but even if it was in English, like you, maybe you, Caroline, wouldn't find it cool, but people are yeah. finding it cool because people bad do, people do be finding it cool. Yeah. 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 They can get away with a lot. And honestly, I revere it. I would like to learn how that's <laughs> how to take she, some of that. Here's one. Here's a line of poetry. This could be a sonnet. She wake up, eat this dick, call that breakfast in bed. I, I, it would be almost impossible to differentiate that from any sonnet. And that is upheld as the coolest form of lyrics. Yeah. I like that lyric. I know that song. That's a good one. I I have been thinking a lot lately and I, I want to talk about it on the podcast. Okay. Literally 0.2% of the population relates to this. (laughs) Do you remember Preem's? (laughs) yeah yeah when we were in elementary school so like first through fourth grade Mm -hmm. there was an award ceremony every friday morning that would happen like instead of assembly we would go to this room at school and we'd all sit in alphabetical order or height order or something unnecessary it was height order it was height order because i was always at the front of the line yeah there you go yeah and um they would give out awards for the week for like kids who were the best at whatever the subject best that kids, week. the best the best kids, kids. To all the best kids the most eligible children right and it was like the history award the math award the science award music like all the different classes had a prize of the week and then and people in each grade won one mm-hmm. um and then we'd have to go up and accept First of all, okay, there's Except so much to dissect I just can't there. This was, I can't believe this was every week. First of all, all these stories about our childhood are so kind of gross, but this They're is so what happened. They're so fucked up. They're and so, uh, it explains so much. I can't believe this was every week that there was like, what have you accomplished in a week? Can I, I, can I guess? Can I guess what awards you won? Yeah, sure. Did you have I had a couple. Music? Did you win? I, you had a couple? Shut the fuck up. That's I had a couple that I was in you, rotation uh, for, and I'm sure you also had to. a couple you were in rotation no. for. No, no, no. I think I only ever won one award. First of all, I wanted to win the award so bad. I wanted to win the best awards you could get, the biggest ones. 
um, we went to this Catholic school and they had like the five goals of the sacred heart, which were like developmental morals and values, these five goals of, in the education, sacred heart education. And the best, the best baby girl you could be would be a baby girl who wins one of these awards. I mm -hmm. wanted one of those awards so bad. It went to all the good kids, the best kids, like the most respectable, the Meredith Mangolds and, and the Jessica DeBakey's, I feel like, of, yeah. of the school. You're not wrong. I wanted to win those <laughs> awards so bad. You know, I fucking never did. Um, no. In second grade, I got, I got the poetry award. I won a poetry award one time. That's huge. That's huge. <laughs> I think that's huge. I feel like that award, I feel like they added it that year maybe. It was like new yeah, fresh. <laughs> thrown me a bone. <laughs> and I was I'm like, poetry, like we're seven. What's she doing? <laughs> I could see you having won the music. You yeah. get some fucking music ass awards. Um, something probably about like building community or being nice yeah. to people. Fuck yeah. yeah. I those are my those. two. I wanted the Building Community Award despite the fact that I refused to speak to anyone but <laughs> Sheila. I just wanted to be seen as good, but I was a bad boy. You would hang out with me more on the weeks that you were like, maybe I can get Building Community this week if I like stand yeah. by Jess. I don't know um, what was wrong with me. I wanted all these like really moral awards, but I wasn't doing anything to deserve them. It is funny. You're like... Um attachment to morality as a child is very interesting to me but like christian morality you know yeah um yeah. but yeah the weirdest part of it though is then we would have to go up and accept the award so they'd call your name you'd stand in your place <laughs> they'd like read a thing about you and then you'd go up and accept the award from the headmistress of our school sister dyer and you had to like shake her hand simultaneously Give her a firm handshake this and old also nun. curtsy. An elderly nun. Yes. And an elderly nun. Oh my God. Oh my God curtsy and firm handshake at the same time. And we would literally have. We had practice. Every once in a while, we would have like practices for preems where the teachers would have us run through how it all goes before Sister Dyer was going to show up. And we would practice shaking hands. We would practice curtsying. We would get feedback on those things. And it's so weird that like with shaking hands, they were so insistent. They wanted us to give a firm handshake, no floppy fish, which honestly is a great thing to this day. I have a very like respectable, firm handshake. I feel like it does handshake. me well in yeah. business. However, <laughs> at the same time, we were curtsying. So it's like, what do you want us to be? Am I the oh, cotillion little girly? Yeah. Or am I like the or boss am I business bitch? bitch? Right. Sometimes um, it goes. I've just been thinking about that a lot lately for some That's reason. Funny. And I think it explains a lot of a lot of us feeling lost probably when we got older. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a weird it was a weird school. What a until. fucking weird time. This has been not for everyone. Um, follow us on Instagram at not for everyone pod. That's the number four in there. I'm on Instagram, Jay-Z DeBakey. Caroline's on YouTube, Caroline Winkler. Um, you can follow us on Winkler, too. Uh, bleh, follow on us on Winkler. Winkler. <laughs> That'd be a cool platform. Follow it's just us me. on all you, all you can do on the Winkler platform is look at me and my family doing stuff. Cute. People love doing yeah. that, by the way. Yeah, you can follow us on YouTube, too. Not for everyone. We're on there with videos pretty much every week. And leave us a review on apple i would love to see it i love reading them they make my day 95 uh -huh. of the time so do that for us this week anything we else share girl? some of them i've been meaning to share some of them on instagram i'm sure some of my favorite reviews on instagram i would love a review written as a haiku is what i would like cute and maybe if incorporate caillou into it how about that yes yeah. something about caillou or whatever speaks to you <laughs> um haiku doesn't have to rhyme um I'll, i'm gonna share some of my most artistic favorite reviews i think on our instagram because there's some people be cooking out yeah straight from the poetry prize second grade winner <laughs> she's gonna rank the haikus all I'm right love you thanks guys bye okay we're done. We i think we are it. fucking done oh, we're so mm -hmm. done i think we're done Stop dog this okay.